the experts. Astronomy as a whole is nearly impossible to confine to a single interview. The amount of offshoots and ramifications of potential discoveries is virtually endless. So we decided to bring you another angle into this field, but this time with fundamental questions that both captivate the common mind and fuel the professional's latest research. How are our galaxies arranged? What is our universe even made of? Can life be out there? And if so, where? Our expert today is York University Professor Marshall McCall, Chair at the Department of Astronomy and Physics, Director of the Undergraduate Program in Biophysics, specializing in formation, evolution, and structure of galaxies and interstellar matter. I've been interested in astronomy since elementary school and in fact my earliest memory which was when I was around four years old is when my mother took me by the hand outside at night to go and watch Sputnik come by. It was a vivid memory and it was great and exciting to go outside at night which is something I hadn't normally done. I never, don't remember seeing Sputnik but obviously <laughs> the, the search for it, the quest, led me to get excited enough and carry forward with that ultimately become a career astronomer. I automatically knew what I wanted to do in university, so it was natural for me to go from high school directly into an astronomy program, and I was lucky enough that uh, the university in my hometown, Victoria, British Columbia, did have an astronomy program. Now, it was part of a physics program, and so I was engaged in all kinds of physics education as well. I did the physics because it was necessary to become a, a proper astronomer. I didn't intend originally to, to engage in so much physics, but I enjoyed it. It was a part of the game and it is still a very important part of the game of becoming an astronomer today. It was natural for me to immediately proceed into astronomy. I've never ever wanted to deviate into another educational pursuit. From the outside world was when the Hubble Space Telescope took an image of the Eagle Nebula, the pillars of creation as they were called, where stars were being born. One of the all-time greatest images ever achieved. I actually knew the person who was engaged in that particular research project when I was a graduate student actually at Texas. So that was a highlight for me, just a visual picture of this incredible uh, region of star formation. A highlight from my own research was developing a map of the organization of galaxies locally. The realization that the galaxies around us out to something like 20 million light years in all directions are confined to a pancake. They're all confined to a sheet now known as the local sheet. No one really was clear about that before but it's uh, led to the recognition that galaxies are not randomly dispersed amongst the in the universe. They're organized into sheets and filaments and voids and walls, a cosmic structure known as the cosmic web. A bachelor's degree was four years, a master's two, PhD was another four. Then I came to York University after a stint in Australia, actually, as a postdoctoral fellow. I spent some time at University of Toronto, too, uh, in 1988. So I've been here for over 30 years. The two biggest problems in science, in my view today, are the, what is the nature of dark matter and what is the nature of dark energy. It's been evident for quite a long time, since the 1930s, to be able to explain the motions of stars and gas and inside galaxies. There has to be more in those galaxies than you can actually see. And that's led to the realization that something like 85%, 90% of a galaxy is made of stuff that we cannot see and only demonstrates its presence through its gravitational force. Nobody knows what this is. The current consensus is it's a subatomic particle that has yet to be discovered. And there are a lot of experiments going on to actually seek that particle. The Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland is trying to make particles without really knowing what they are or whether or not they'll be successful. But nobody yet has been able to detect something that could be considered to be a dark matter particle and nobody's been able to make one. But it's also been proposed that dark matter is a figment of our imagination in the sense that maybe the laws of physics are not correct on the scales we're talking about. Evidence for dark matter is a consequence of not having the correct physics invoked. The normal matter and the dark matter, that constitutes about 27% of the universe. The scary part is there's another 73% called dark energy 
Nobody has any idea what it is. But it's something out there that is causing the expansion of the universe. The universe is an expanding place. It's growing in size as we talk. The expansion of the universe is actually accelerating rather than decelerating, as we used to think, brought about by the force of the gravity of everything within it. So uh, nobody has any idea what dark energy is, but it makes up 70, the other 73% of the universe. In the amateur world, the perception of astronomy is different in the professional world. You cannot explore the cosmos deeply without having strength in physics. It's fundamental. Everything we've been talking about, we've mentioned gravity all the time, dark matter, dark energy, that's all physics. You have to have a strong grounding in physics and, and, and man, the mathematics to go with it. Yeah, the way I do it is this. I use a light beam. A light beam is the fastest that we believe information can be transmitted. Imagine yourself standing on a light beam in Toronto and ask yourself how long will it take for me to get to Vancouver. It'll take one one hundredth of a second. Five hours by plane, hundredth of a second on a light beam. So now we go out to the near universe, our solar system. The sun is at a distance from us such that light from the sun takes eight minutes to get to us, right? Now we've gone from a hundredth of a second from Toronto to Vancouver. Now we're up to eight minutes from the sun to the Earth, the nearest star, and this is only the nearest part of the universe beyond the solar system, light takes four years now to go from the nearest star to us. So now we'll go on to the scale of a galaxy. The time it takes light to go from the center of the Milky Way to us is about 25,000 years. And really across the entire galaxy, it's more like 150,000 years. The technology that's made the greatest difference to me would be computational. I remember I wrote my master's thesis using a typewriter and carbon paper. Many people today probably don't even know what carbon paper is. It's a black piece of paper that you put under another sheet of paper. And when you type on the one on the piece of paper on the top, the blackness is transferred to another piece of paper underneath. So you get a copy. The other major breakthrough has been storage space. I remember when I started at York University, we astronomers were like leaders in sort of the technology that we were confronting computationally. We as a group spent over $20,000 to get a hard disk drive that had 11 gigabytes of capacity. Now you can go to the store and for $100 buy a terabyte disk, but we spent $20,000 on 11 gigabytes. So that you can see, this, it's just incredible, the advances that have been made with uh, storage. I went to astronomy because I like to get out there and use a telescope and look through it initially, but ultimately have cameras attached to it. Nowadays, astronomers rarely do that. For one thing, new methods of observing have been developed, especially at large observatories that don't require astronomers to go there. What I would do if I wanted to observe on the Canada France wide telescope is I would write a proposal. If it was granted some telescope time, what would happen is it would be put in a queue in order of priority. Somebody there would make the observations for you once they had done the proposals that were ranked higher than yours. I first write a proposal on my computer. The observations are done for me and they send the data to me on my computer. And then I sit down in front of my computer and I analyze the data using software on my computer. And then I go and write my paper about the results on my computer. Like it's completely computerized, right? The other piece of advice I would give to somebody besides getting the right background to become an astronomer, learn as much as you humanly can about computation. One of the great survey telescopes right now is called Gaia. It's a European telescope in space, and its objective is to map out stars all over the sky, mostly in the Milky Way. We now have data in the form of a motion across the sky, ever so subtle, for a billion, a billion stars. There are 300 billion to work on in the Milky Way, but nevertheless, a billion is one three hundredth, so <laughs> you're getting there, but, but far faster than you could ever imagine before. Another huge frontier is extraterrestrial life and habitability of planets. Now we're at the point where we're actually able to detect evidence for Earth-sized planets that are going around other stars. With the launch of this big space telescope in the next couple of years called JWST, we expect to be able to study the atmospheres of these planets as they go across their stars and determine whether they might be rich in oxygen, which would be evidence for life of some form on the planet because oxygen comes from plants. 
I see huge advances being made in the realm of planetary systems and ultimately habitability of those systems and evidence for life upon them. What we're trying to do is set up a small system, ultimately four of these fast lenses, to look for faint extended sources associated with galaxies. If you can find yourself a fast optical system, it doesn't really matter how big it is, it's going to be very adept at detecting faint extended sources. I'm working with a graduate student, her name is Anna Skrinnick. What she's doing in particular is building the interface between the instrumentation and the computer to allow us to actually control this instrument. So we're putting this uh, system together to be mounted on the side of one of our telescopes. The telescope will be used to point it, but the observations will be made with the set of lenses that are on the side. What Anna is doing is she's writing the software to tell the camera when to open its shutter, how long to take its picture, when to close the shutter, and then when to transmit the data over to the main computer. Initially, she's working on just one of the cameras, but in the end, we're gonna have four, and we're gonna have them all working in tandem together. So we'll four cameras to expose all at the same time. We'll read out the data from all four cameras. We'll be blending the data in the computer. So she's the one that's working on all the software that's required to make all this happen. We got to where we are today by virtue of people thinking about problems and solving them. The problems that we are confronting and trying to solve should be of interest to anybody with curiosity. For example, whether or not there are other intelligent beings in the universe would matter to the average person. So the pathway to gaining support for funding our endeavors is to excite people about the returns to our knowledge. There can be economic spin-offs. The space program suffered the same fate originally. People were skeptical about it. They thought it was a waste of money. You should be spending more money on relieving hunger and solving housing problems. But out of the space program came all kinds of technological advances that are now a part of everyday life. But, you know, I would rather excite people about solving problems that really are advancing the knowledge of the human race and making us understand better our place within, within the universe. How do we do that? We try to get out and inform the public about their universe in which they live. We try to expose them to our facilities, our telescopes, our instruments. We aim in the end to take something that may at first seem scary and make people feel warm and fuzzy about it. We think that by so doing, these non-science students, which may go on to become movers and shakers in the world, leaders of countries, by doing what we do, we think we may have an impact on the public perception of science and in the end, funding for scientific endeavors that come from that. With some of the most fundamental aspects of our cosmos still unsolved, Astronomy still remains on the vanguard of scientific research. Over the past centuries, outstanding feats have been achieved, but in other aspects, we are literally only stepping out of the cradle. For those aiming to study the stars, the potential ahead is truly limitless. Join us next episode where we dive into a field whose mission is the very preservation of our life. We'll be talking to a medical doctor and learning the incredible facts we face every day. Join us as we continue our journey of knowledge with the experts.